Qualitative analysis, qualitative analysis is divided into two as far as chemistry is concerned. We have the qualitative organic and we have the qualitative inorganic. Let me split it out. On this side of the board. Qualitative analysis. It is subdivided into qualitative organic, Q organic, mind uh, this side of the board. We have qualitative inorganic. So most of uh, the one set by different examination body. Uh, anyway, any of the two can come in, but the most important one that is normally coming out mostly every year in different kinds of examination body is qualitative inorganic. So we are going to emphasize on this the most, so and then later we talk about the organic. So the qualitative inorganic is divided into three. There are three things you must be able to do. Once you're talking about qualitative inorganic, the first one is identification of gas. You must be able to identify gas. Gas identification is one of it. Then the second one is identification of anions. Anions. How do you identify anions in solution? Then lastly, under this, identification of cations. Identification of cations. Those are positive ions and anions are negative ions. But you need to understand the concept of identification of gases because, because it gives the idea of the type of anion present in such solution you are working with. So when I when I talk about identification of gases, it's much more important. I do tell people that knowing identification of gases very well, I and mean, once you're able to identify gases. It will give you an information about the type of anion present in the solution. So how can you identify gases? Anyway, we have three schemes, or let's say three approach to identification of gases. Let's look at the three approach. The first approach in identification of gases, the first approach, you need to first of all look at the color and the odor. Then secondly, you will consider the action of the gas on litmus paper. This will only differentiate whether it is an acidic gas, basic gas, or neutral gas. So, action on litmus paper. After you might have done this too, if the information provided is yet to convince you or is yet to tell you the type of gas that you're working with or that you are trying to identify, then you go for the confirmatory test. But this two step here will guide you on which confirmatory test you are going to go for. Or probably, if we're talking about exams, uh, the material provided for you to perform the test and the first two steps of the, of the step of the test will tell you, okay, this is the gas we are meant to identify. And probably by performing the confirmatory test, you'll be able to what? identify such gas. Because all gases have their specific confirmatory test. I mean, they have a particular test that each one of them is peculiar to all of them, each one of them. So, Though we have some gases that have similar confirmatory tests, we have some that have three confirmatory tests, one of which, one of the three or two confirmatory tests might be similar to another gas. So the best way is to know the, the, the particular confirmatory test that defines that, that, that gas in question. So then the third step is the one confirmatory test. So once you are able to confirm a gas, then you will be able to know the, the type of gas that you are working with or that you are 
about to identify or that you have already identified. So now let's look at a table. This table here comprises of some gases, like about 12 gases, and um, their action on litmus paper, on their color and odor, and as well their confirmatory test. So we're going to touch them one after the other. We're going to touch them one after the other so we can be familiar with them. So once we are performing a particular test, you might be given different kind of a, um, um, chemicals to work with. But the major thing is, once you know all this, once you have this at the back of your mind, while working, whatever test you perform and you discover one of these apples, then you'll be able to identify such gas. So let's take into consideration, I have said earlier that gases are divided into acidic, basic, and neutral gases. Anyway, we have only three neutral gases existing. And that is, as far as inorganic chemistry is concerned, we have uh, water vapor, is a, is a neutral gas. We have oxygen, we have hydrogen. These are the three neutral gases that we have. Then we have only one alkaline gas, basic gas, and that is ammonia. So every other gas, every other gas as far as inorganic is consigned, they are meant to be acidic. So let's, that, let's have that at the back of our mind in the first place. So once you test for, once you do the first test, the color and the odor, and you are able to identify why, because some gases are odorless and are also colorless. So once, once you go to the litmus test and you are able to identify which gas, either positive, uh, sorry, so, sorry, um, either acidic, basic, or neutral, so once you're able to establish that this particular gas is either acidic or basic or neutral, then you will know how to trace it out, the particular gas it is, by performing confirmatory tests. Once I discover a gas is basic, provided, you know, I mean, discovery has not told me, has, has, not, has not proved that there is any other gas that is basic, except from ammonia, I can as well go and perform the confirmatory test of ammonia to confirm it, that's one. And secondly, once I discover a, a, a gas is uh, is uh, neutral, then I trace to either be the water vapor, hydrogen, or oxygen. So that is what the, the identification of gas came looks like. So now let's look at CO2. This is carbon four oxide, or rather called carbon dioxide. Looking at the color, it is colorless. It has no odor. Then it turns red litmus paper, it turns blue litmus paper red. That is the action of litmus paper. How do you test the gas with litmus paper? Once you're working with a test tube and the gas is about escaping after some effervescence in your reaction, then you dip, you take in two feet of paper, wet one. You, have, you might have wet there because if the paper is not wet, you might not be able to identify the gas. So once you put it, into the gas as it comes out, but ensure that the two fields of uh, the two litmus paper doesn't touch each other, nor touch the big uh, the test tube. So once the gas comes out, it acts on the litmus paper, and you're able to see the color change, then discover which, which type of gas is it either as it acidic, basic, or neutral. So this CO2 turns blue litmus paper red. So that shows that it's an acidic gas. Then the confirmatory test for CO2 is just that it turns lime water milky. Lime water is uh, a, uh, a chemical we use in the lab. So you can actually use your um, capillary tube to take your lime water. If you, if you introduce it to such gas and the lime water turns milky and discover there is milkiness in lime water, then that shows that well, the gas is CO2. Then let's proceed to the next one. We have SO2, that's sulfur dioxide, or sulfur form oxide. It is colorless. It burns. The odor has a, it has a odor of a burning sulfur. If we might be familiar with sulfur, uh, is, is, we have it locally in Africa and in Nigeria to be precise. So the smell of the burning sulfur is a kind of repulsive or let's say irritating smell. So that is the kind of smell that comes from SO2. And it's also an acidic gas because it turns blue litmus paper red. 
So it is there. And the confirmatory test for it is that it turns, it decolorizes KMN4. Or now this one has two confirmatory tests. Is that how you use KMN04? Depending on what you have provided with. If you have KMN04, acidified KMN04 to be precise. Then you dip into capillary tube and introduce into the gas. And once the color of the KMN04 is uh, turns from purple to colorless, then the gas is what? Is SO2. And because there are other gases that make use of this same test, this same confirmatory test, that also decolorizes KMN04. So which other one can we use to confirm for that if it is SO2? So we can also try with potassium tetraoxydichromate 6. This KMN04 is called potassium tetraoxomanganate 7. So this is potassium tetraoxydichromate 6. So once you introduce it to such gas, which is SO2, it turns green. And the, pop, the color is orange. Then it turns green. The color of KMN04 is purple. Once you introduce it to SO2 gas, it becomes colorless. So this has confirmed SO2. Then we have H2S, hydrogen sulfide. It is colorless. The smell is like that of a rotten egg. So we can, let's go into conclusion that this type of gas, gas coming out from the rotten egg is hydrogen sulfide. So, and it is also an acidic gas because it turns blue in the paper red. Then the confirmatory test is it turns this solution once you dip a paper, a filter paper, into the solution of lead 2 ethanoate or lead, lead 2 transnitrate 5. Once you drop a filter paper into them, that means it has been wet with these solutions, either of these two, then you introduce the such gas. Once the paper turns black, it shows that what? Hydrogen sulfide is present. And the gas is confirmed to be what? H2S, provided the gas has a rotting egg smell and it turns red with a blue dip of paper, red. So now we can proceed to NO2, that's nitrogen dioxide. We have reddish brown in color, the color is reddish brown. It has an irritating smell and it is also an acidic gas. Um, but the confirmatory test is a starch iodide paper. Once we introduce a starch iodide paper, if the starch iodide paper turns blue black, then it has confirmed NO2. Though we have other gases that uses the same confirmatory test with it, but at least the, the first two tests, which is the color and the odor with the litmus test, will be able to tell us if it is NO2. And besides, how, what do I mean by starch iodide paper? We can get a filter paper, dip into a starch solution, then after that, potassium iodide solution. After this, uh, the paper must have been dipped into a starch solution, then we dip into potassium iodide solution. We already have the starch iodide paper. Or probably the cell in uh, uh, places where you can get laboratory equipment and materials. So once such paper is introduced to a gas, and the gas turns, uh, it's blue-black. So. Uh, that shows that what it is NO2. And there are kind of reactions that takes place to give us all these visible reactions we are seeing. But yet we cannot explain that now because we are not performing a specific type of reaction. Until you perform a particular type of reaction, then you will be able to see this. So now let's proceed to HCl. It is colorless, it has an irritating smell or a repulsive smell, then it is also an acidic gas. Then it forms, the confirmatory test says, it forms white foams with NH3, NH3 solution on the view. Is that you dip the paper into it, or you take the stopper of the solution, then introduce it to such gas. When you introduce it at the mouth of the stopper, you can see the formation of white foams. And this white foam shows that what HCl reacted with what NH3 to produce, NH4Cl, so which is white in nature and powder. So this white foam shows that what is HCl is confirmed. Or alternatively, a white uh, PPT, it forms white PPT with silver trismetric 5, AgNO3. AgNO3 in a capillary tube solution introduced to such gas HCl. So once there is a white foam, uh, sorry, white precipitate, then that confirms HCl. Then we have fluorine gas. How do we identify that? 
it is greenish yellow in color, irritating smell, and it is also an acidic gases. But not just that. When you tested uh, chlorine with litmus paper, it turns blue litmus paper red and also bleaches it at the same time. Not only chlorine does that, most of the allergens does that. They turn the, the litmus paper into red and then bleaches. So that is one. Then lastly, we can find the uh, confirmatory test, which is tall starch iodide paper blue. blue. Don't forget, NO2 also does, does the same thing. But here, yeah, color and odor will be used to differentiate them. Yeah, color and odor will be used to differentiate them. So even if they have the same confirmatory test, they still have different color and different odor. So we can proceed to bromine. This is reddish brown color. It has an irritating smell. It turns red litmus paper, blue litmus paper red, and then bleaches. Then the, the confirmatory test says it stores tetrafluoromethane brown. Tetrafluoromethane CCL4 is a solution that is colorless. So when you introduce it into the gas bromine, then it stores brown. Then we have iodine. Iodine is purple in color. Then it has an irritating smell. It stores blue liquid paper red and then bleaches it. Then Another confirmatory test, which is similar to that of uh, NO2 and that of uh, chlorine, is torn starch iodide paper blue black. Just like we have been saying, but to make it exceptional to differentiate it from others, it also has another confirmatory test which turns CCL for purple. Unlike bromine that turns it brown, it turns the tetrachloromethane solution purple. Then we have NH3. It is colorless. It has a choking smell, irritating smell. Then um, sometimes I, I normally call the smell of ammonia something similar to that of urine. So and then it forms white films with HCl, HCl solution, not HCl gas. So the HCl solution, when you introduce it to NH3 gas, it forms white film due to the formation of ammonium chloride. Then uh, we have oxygen here, yeah, it is colorless, odorless, and it has no action on litmus paper. But the confirmatory test shows that because oxygen supports combustion, so you can introduce a glowing splint towards the gas. Once the glowing splint rekindles, then such gas is oxygen because it is only oxygen that supports combustion. Then we have hydrogen. It forms with the pop sound, that is the confirmatory test, and as you can see, it is colorless, odorless, and neutral to litmus paper. So it forms with the pop sound. Was it pop? There is a preview, there is a video we shot on this channel that contains um, uh, a gap, a, a identification of gas with this hydrogen gas, where we make use of aluminium foil and sodium hydroxide in production of hydrogen gas. Then we light it up with the hair, and it forms with that kind of sound. So. You can make reference to that video and watch so to prove that hydrogen gas bonds with the pop sound. Now we have water vapor. How do we identify if a gas is water vapor? Anyway, we have two schemes of this, but the first one might not be genuine because once you put a stopper towards the gas and there is formation of, you know, there is condensation and you're able to see the liquid form of the gas on the stopper and it shows that it's water vapor. And secondly, it turns, this is the confirmatory test anyway, turns copper 2 tetrasorbate 6 powder to blue. This copper 2 tetrasorbate 6 powder is white in color. Once you introduce it to a gas and the gas is water vapor, it's going to turn it blue because of the formation of hydrated copper 2 tetrasorbate 6. Meanwhile, this is not hydrated here. Thanks for watching. We're going to bring you more video on this particular topic called quantitative qualitative analysis and also on quantitative analysis. Please subscribe. Thank you.